Welcome back to episode 38 of the Operators Pod. It is just going to be Mike and I this week because Sean is moving back to California and Jason is still on vacation. We're wondering when he's coming back, if he's coming back. Oh, he's got to come back. He's got a ton of pans to sell. Anyway, today we're actually digging into inventory. This is my least favorite topic. I'm going to warn you now. But we had a lot of fun and I actually think this was really valuable and I'm going to probably go back and rewatch this because I learned some things from Mike and he's doing a Incredible job with that company. Anyway, let's dig into it. Episode 38. Sean's moving. Jason's still on vacation. I think he sold a lot of pans in December, so we decided to take a couple weeks off. Uh, it's good though. We're going to talk inventory today. Um, this is like, I hope we can keep this topic not as boring as I find it operationally. Well, That's my, my hope for us today. <laughs> it, 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 if it's, it is kind of a boring topic, but it's like, it's, it's sneaky boring because it's the most dangerous thing probably about running a consumer company. I think like I had run a, an e-commerce business, but we mostly drop shipped. So like we, we, plugged in uh, with partners and we drop shipped, we would sell it to customers. And then, so we didn't have the inventory risk the first several years I was in e-commerce. And when we started Simple Modern, I, I was in for a rude awakening that you, you can eat up all your profits and then some, you can destroy your cash flow by not being effective at how you manage inventory. And so uh, I really, I came to appreciate that inventory management was just as important as being profitable in terms of yeah. running, you know, a strong business. So uh, it's, uh, it was impressed upon me pretty quickly when I was like, where's the money? And there was no money that I it's was going to have to get a lot better here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Dude, it freaked me out. I know Sean's not here, but when he texted, uh, in one of our chats, I think, I don't, I'm sure you were in it where he was like, I'm super pumped. I've got six months worth of inventory. And I literally like, I got like high I'm like, that's so much like for us, like we would never keep sure. that much stock on hand. Um, so I'm curious, like I've got so many questions and so many ways we can, we can do this. Um, what, like if you were to give, so let's say we're talking to somebody brand new, like they're, they're, you know, they're maybe a year or two in to this like e-commerce thing, retail, whatever it is, you're only allowed to impart one piece of advice when it comes to inventory. What is it? Like, what's the one thing you've got 30 seconds to like, or two minutes to tell someone, what is it? Cause it's mm. so complicated. It's a great question. I, I mean, I think it's that the only way you grow is through buying inventory first. And if you buy bad inventory, you're dead. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if that's an oversimplification, but it's just, it's the number one way you kill your business. You kill your growth that, that you, um, you bankrupt a successful business and that is counterintuitive. The way that people tend to think about business is if I buy things and then I sell them for, you know, significantly more than I bought them, then I've got a great business and, you know, uh, it's going to work out great. And it's like, well, not, not necessarily. And mm -hmm. so I think the counterintuitive nature of, of that piece that it's not as simple as do you have things that people want and you can sell them at a profit. It's you have to make decisions before you sell about where you're going to place your bets and you can be wrong enough. You can bankrupt yourself even when people want what you have. Hmm. Do you guys, uh, I mean, like I know we've, there's been like multiple chats on inventory of last year or two. How much, like what, what's the sweet spot for you? Like how many months of stock do you try to keep? Cause you guys are like us, we have so many SKUs, like colors and sizes. And like, there's just like, I literally have thousands of SKUs yeah. when you look at everything. Right. Um, how many months of stock are you, when you're looking at reporting, what's a number that makes you like warm and fuzzy and what's a number that starts to give you the heebie jeebies? Yeah. So it's a great question. I, uh, let me, let me for, to, to kind of put out some kind of boundaries on this thing, a couple of things that you have to say. One is that 
uh, all of this stuff is nuanced, right? Mm-hmm. Like you, you ever, anytime, you know, like I, I saw somebody ask you in our Slack channel the other day, like what percentage of your traffic that's coming from marketing versus organic is good? And you're like, I, I don't even, you know, the, the you question know that? does not even compute. <laughs> like, even if you could know it, I don't know what the right answer is. And so anytime you start talking about an inventory and you say, well, hey, what's the, what's the good number? It's, it's so trite, but it's like, well, it depends. I think there are some principles that that apply. And the first one that I would lay out is that you're, you're looking at what is the underlying risk profile of the product. And the more risky that product is in one way or another, the less you want to have of that at any given point in time because you don't know what's going to happen. So let, let's talk about some of the things that can lead to a piece of inventory being more risky. Well, one is if it is a piece of technology that churns quickly, you're, you're the perfect, you know, poster uh, example, poster boy yep. example of this, that phone cases, you know, they have a, a shelf, shelf life and then it just drops off dramatically. So anything where you know that the market is going to disrupt, I mean, another good example here is food. Um, mm. or things that can spoil, um, fashion items, high, high fashion items can be this way. Um, so, you know, there's other things that are contextual, like, you know, Alabama, you know, 2015 national championship t-shirts. Like there are things that have shorter shelf lives. And yep. so there's risk inherent in that because your timeline that you have to sell that is short uh, one of the classic examples from recently, a lot of the mass retailers run on fairly, they try and run things fairly tight. And during COVID, when ships were coming over here and the Long Beach port was overwhelmed and could not unload everything that was waiting to be unloaded, you had a situation where people would get their containers 60 days, 90 days, you know, 150 days after they thought they were going to get them. Well, if you're trying to run things fairly tight, what ends up happening is you get a bunch of your Christmas stuff in January. Mm -hmm. And so guess what happens if you get a bunch of Christmas trees and cocoa bombs in January? And the answer is like, you're, you're, you're just not going to sell it for a year. You're going to have to sit on that for a year. So sometimes there's a time risk of like, Hey, past this date, no one's going to want to buy this. And sometimes the time risk is just, Hey, past this date, you're going to have to wait a cycle. You yeah, know, seasonal, to be able to, right? Yeah, like back yeah. to school would be another good example. Like if you miss, you know, you miss back to school, you got to wait for back to school next year. So that's that's one that we see a lot is, you know, is there some kind of time-based risk associated with this piece of inventory? The mm-hmm. other big one that we see is, do we have confidence of product market fit with this piece of inventory? So perfect example here would be we're, let's say we're going to launch a new water bottle and we feel really good about its chances, but we actually haven't seen, you know, any sales data. So how much of that water bottle do you buy for your initial order? Because you want to buy enough that if it resonates with customers that you have it in stock and that you're able to deliver um, and take advantage of that. But you don't want to buy too much because you know that there's a chance that it just never reaches product market fit. That for whatever reason, people don't like that water bottle. They, they choose the ones you already have, whatever. And then you've got a real problem on your hands. So I, I think where you are in a product's life cycle matters a lot. And then the, mm-hmm. the third risk factor that I've seen um, has to do with uh, specificness. So we're, uh, you do some licensed stuff. We do a lot of licensed products. Uh, again, I'll go to the sports example or actually Disney might even be a better example here. But w- once you put something like Mickey Mouse or the, the 49ers on a cup, now you are you're shrinking your total addressable market to a much, much more narrow portion of the population. And so if you way over buy, it's very difficult to fix that because you have a limited number of people that you could possibly sell to the, and to, to kind of, uh, exacerbate the issue that can happen here, especially with specific inventory. Usually there's a contractual right to sell it. 
And if you don't have that contractual right to sell it, you can't sell it. So banks, a lot of times when they're lending you money, they'll look at your asset base to decide how much to lend you. We have never been able to get any credit on our bank lending for our licensed product because the bank says if we, rep- you know, if Armageddon happens and we repossess this product and we tried to sell it, we would be unable to because we're not, we're not licensed. How much of your, so I know we're going to talk like, um, on demand manufacturing, print on demand, customization, like all mm-hmm. that stuff. How much of your decision to bring manufacturing, at least some of it back to America was based on the financial engineering piece? Cause that's a really interesting point that like, like what I'm thinking, right. Is that if you kept all of your blanks on hand in inventory, so they're non-decorated. Mm-hmm. They have no mm-hmm. sports team logos on them. Mm-hmm. Your bank will absolutely lend against a black water bottle. That's right. Like there's a big ass market for that. Um, but if you buy them and bring them in decorated, you've, you've actually like you diminished the value of that inventory, right? Mm-hmm. To a, a lender, you know, not yeah. to you. Um, and by going, sp- so it's funny too, like what I think is an interesting way to look at that um, as well as what Sean and I in the last episode were talking about uh, like using product to like new, either new product launches, whether it's new category, new decoration, you use that to reach like new audience on paid platforms. Right. Um, like that's the whole point of like, that's right. a big point of like why we went to like, we call it art on demand. It's like, we can come up with a design, have that product in market and selling and shipping in, on, in a few days. That was to like feed the digital ad platforms, Meta, Google, et cetera. The downside to that, so it's like getting us more audience reach, but the, what you just mentioned is really important is it's also narrowing the value of that inventory at the same time, mm-hmm. right? So if you can't do it on demand, the more you spread out that type, like, you know, specific inventory, you're actually like increasing liability at a, like a non-linear rate compared to like, you know, more general stock. Because this is an inventory episode, we really got to call out Fulfill. One of the things that's interesting to me is their actual demand planning piece. So if you've ever run one of these companies where you're selling physical things, and we're going to talk about it in this episode, how much to buy and when, and that is such an art and science that I think any kind of tooling that helps with that is a win. Um, It saves you just building custom spreadsheets and all that good stuff. So shout out to Fulfill. Yeah. Well, you can, you can certainly, one of our worst mistakes we made had to do with when we got licensed with Marvel and they really encouraged us to, you know, produce inventory for every single Marvel character that had been turned into a film. And that was not a good idea because uh, the demand varies wildly between those. <laughs> those the different, yeah, and, and even some of the movies that did well, like, you know, like people didn't want to buy that character's water bottle. And so I, I think that you're right. Like using, and, and this is something we can kind of segue into, but using different tactics to reduce the amount of inventory exposure as part of being an effective operator. And that's really going to be the the thematic theme. Now, what those tactics are that can be effective for you and how to how to pull that off, I think can vary based on, you know, industry, how you're situated, strength of your balance sheet, different things like that, but you have to have some tactics to reduce risk. Because you've got this kind of uh, scale and on one side is potential growth and on the other side is potential risk. And what you're constantly trying to do is say, how do I give myself the maximum opportunity for growth I can without taking on an amount of risk that's unacceptable, right? Right. Because, and, and this is one of the reasons why when we talk about growth and we start saying, you know, gosh, you start growing faster than 50, 100%, you shouldn't do it. And people will say, well, why is that? Like, it seems like that would be good. And it's like, well, because pay for it. <laughs> the amount, yeah, the amount, even, and even if you can, the amount of risk you're taking on, on the inventory side is so large that, you yeah. know, if you think there's a, a great story about Patagonia where at one year they thought they were going to grow whatever, 75% and they grew 30% and it almost bankrupted the company yep. that no matter how strong your brand If you overshoot in your growth expectations by too much, then you're going to have 
a yeah. huge hole in your balance sheet from the inventory. But like you said, when we got into domestic manufacturing, one of the things that was the most attractive is I looked at the working capital of our business and realized, you know, the vast majority of it was sitting in inventory. And, and if you think about it from a, a little bit of an abstracted view, like it's a very inefficient allocation of capital. We, we've got a great inventory uh, you know, planning team here at Simple Modern, which we've gone through. I mean, we've had, we've had years where it went great and years where it didn't go as well. But I think as a group, we've learned quite a bit. But one of the things that the guy who leads the group, Brett Bone, has, will say all the time is like, on every skew, you're going to be wrong. You just don't know which way you're going to be wrong. And what you hope is when you roll all that up, like you said, maybe yep. for some people here, they've got one SKU, their business, and so it's a little bit easier. As you get more and more SKUs, like we have you know, like thousands, you have thousands, then you hope in aggregate you're, you're landing on an acceptable thing. But as you start to zoom in, it's a dumpster fire. Like everything's wrong. You're going to be wrong. And, and maybe that's one of the, the high-level principles is when it comes to inventory, you will be wrong. But yeah. do you have ways to mitigate when you're wrong, uh, and are when you're wrong, is it going to blow you up financially? You know, these are the questions. These are the things that you're trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the inventory is a game of um, like managing downside. It really is. Mm -hmm. Like it's like I, I'm always. Um, I think like you could easily criticize me for being cautious when it comes to buying inventory, just because I'd rather be wrong that way. I would rather sure. like go into December peak gifting season and just run out as opposed to like, I've been on the other side. Like I have absolutely been there where like you go into Q4, you're over inventoried, but you don't really know until like December 15th, yeah. 18th, 15th, 18th when gifting ends. And now you're like, holy shit, you know, we're a seasonal business. I got to wait yeah. you know, 12 months yeah, it's for my not next shot on goal. It's not as simple as saying, so let's talk about this in a couple different contexts. You can be heavy on inventory in the micro, which means I'm heavy on inventory in specific spots and it's yep. really specific to my company. So I thought, you know, Captain Marvel water bottles would sell. I bought Captain Marvel water bottles. They, they will not sell. And so I'm heavy in this skew, yep. um, this very like specific skew. So the, the strategy in that case is almost always I'm going to try and cut price or if you can contain it to a low percentage of your portfolio, you can just write it out. Like we had SKUs where yep. it's like, man, we might have four years worth. Yep. And sometimes you even consider destroying inventory because you're like, well, I get to harvest 40 something percent of that and taxes back. And, you know, I mean, you look at Amazon the time. might consider it for you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the, the time value of money starts to come into play here. Yep. So when you're. When, when it's in the micro, hey, this is not, uh, we'll say, existentially threatening to my balance sheet and it's kind of contained and the contagion is managed, then you have options. But what tends to happen, and this is what happened during COVID, is it tends to be in the macro where mm. it's like holistically, we just missed on our expectations for growth. We thought we were going to grow 60% across the portfolio this year. We grew 25. And a lot of times the reason why those holistic misses will happen, I've seen two. One is that you've been growing really fast as a brand and it's hard to understand how your growth curve is going to look. But the other is that there's larger macro factors at play. And mm -hmm. we've seen that for sure the last two or three years that larger macro factors can absolutely sink you. And so uh, just to kind of walk through how this can be such a, a dangerous situation. Let's say um, that you're working with a retailer and you're one of the 10 brands that's every day on the shelf at the retailer and the retailer and you work up a projection for the upcoming year and you think you're going to sell a million water bottles. So you're like, Okay, million water bottles, you order it, you've got your supply chain ready. And then what happens is we go into a recession and spending on water bottles is 10% lighter than you expected it to be. And you're, you know, 
you're in a great position. You're the strongest out of the 10 brands on the shelf. So if nothing happened, you would only be 10% heavy on inventory. You'd only have 100,000 extra bottles. You could manage that. But that's not how it goes. What will happen is somebody on that shelf ends up being 60% heavy, 40% heavy. And then what that person's going to do is they are going to cut price in a big mm -hmm. time way. And that's not necessarily going to create more buyers. It's just going to create disruption in what buyers purchase. A lot of times it actually lowers the total number of dollars that are being spent in a category. And it has this ripple effect. So all of a sudden somebody's like, man, we are way heavy. We are, we are, you know, sucking wind. We've got to cut price. They cut price and it creates this disruptive event. And now you're not 10% off pace, you're 25% off pace, or you're 20% off pace. And the, you've got the situation now where it's like, well, somebody else has already gone, you know, and put 25% off all their products. So if somebody else feels heavy, now they've got to go 25 or 30% off their products. And it just creates a, a, a cascading effect that can be really damaging. So I, I don't know how you totally avoid it, but I will say this, the worst time to be heavy on inventory is when everybody's heavy on inventory. And the best yeah. time to be heavy on inventory is when everybody else is light on inventory. How you pull that off, I don't know, but it's also worth being aware that the poor planning of your competitors will affect you in this area. You know, there's a bunch of things that I could unpack there, man. I think it's like what you just said is brilliant and people need to go back and listen to that again. Um, you know, what you're hitting on is one of the reasons why investors hate consumers so much because mm -hmm. there's so much category risk, right? Um, like what you just highlighted is that it doesn't matter how good you are at managing your business and your brand. And we often hear, at least in on the marketing side of things, about like managing discounts and managing price and then brand perception and brand value. And, you know, if you discount, you could hurt the brand value. We don't talk enough about category. And if the category is all of a sudden tipping into an unhealthy place at an inventory base, yeah, right? And you're in retail, we're talking like big retail, not just this piddly little pond that is D2C, but like big retail categories. The actual category becomes a race to the bottom. And that that, yeah. it, that impacts the consumer spending far beyond what your brand is capable of defending against or manipulating. And that's really important for people to hear because in D2C, we often get confused, like we get confused about what the category is. And most, most of us are in categories that are much, much, much larger offline. And there yeah. are other, way bigger players that we're all yeah. fighting against. Um, and that they actually drive price and like what somebody's willing to pay a lot more than we do and whatever we think our brand equity is. And as, as brands our size, bigger, smaller, like we're all still pretty small relatively speaking, sure. like yeah. into, you know, commerce Absolutely. and the, you know, I, I always go back to like, how does, how do the luxury guys do this? And I mean, they do it with balance sheet and time and that like, they're always okay being light on everything. They don't make mm -hmm. a lot of everything. Their business models built around it. I think the best businesses out there are the ones that are built purely on scarcity as like their core, one of their core values is like, there's just not a lot of it ever. Um, and there never will be a lot of it and that they make that choice early on in their building their business. And then that one choice allows them to play a different inventory game than everybody else who is trying to make the most amount of things. You're right on. I, I think that it took me, so in our business, we had a joking uh, kind of delineation between two groups. We called the top liner club and the bottom liner club. And I was kind of, <laughs> you know, king of the top liner club. I, I want to grow, want to push. But I have been conditioned over time to realize that the risks of being heavy are much more dangerous than the risks of being light, typically. I mean, a simple example of this is if you're selling, even in physical retail, if you're selling in physical retail and you find yourself being really heavy, like that retailer has a lot more of your inventory than they want because you're not moving. When they go into the next commitment cycle, they are looking to get out of positions with yeah. you. They are, if you have the opposite where a retailer is stocking out and you're not getting them the product, they're frustrated with you, but not in a way where they're going to reduce no. how much distribution you're getting. They're just telling you, hey, hurry up, get me more, get me more, get me more. 
And that really the ideal place to be with distribution partners is where, if anything, they're frustrated they can't get a little bit more. Um, yeah, and you and, want them to be there. Yeah, you really you want you want there to be that tension, a little bit of a tension of they wish they could have more. And and we can apply that digitally and say you want the tension of feeling like you left a little bit on the table, yeah. um, because it's much better than the realization that you, you've got more than you need generally. And, yeah, and retailers, you're, you're managing bad behavior, their bad behavior. Sure. Right. Yeah. I mean, like that's really what you're doing. Well, and, and that's worth saying is that there, there will be times, one of the things that e-commerce doesn't deal with as much, although like we will deal with this sometimes in our relationship with Amazon because we're one P they will order in ways sometimes where we're thinking that's not a good idea. And that is, that could lead to a situation where two or three months from now where they're squawking at us saying, Hey, we've got too much of this. So yeah. sometimes we have to manage that, but especially with physical retailers, you can get into situations where you need to kind of push back and protect them against themselves. But it, it, all of this to say, going back to your bigger point about the macro category, I think there were several years where we didn't really feel like we had to think too much about the macro. And now at this point we do, it, it influences yep. us, but if you have a year where you did a bad job of planning inventory and the category has a bad year, you can go under. Even strong businesses can go under. If you have a bad year and the category has a good year, you're fine. If you have a good year and the category has a really bad year, you're probably fine. You know, if you have a good year and the category has a good year, you're you're great. But it's like that's the one combo is that you can't have a really bad year planning wise the same year mm. that the macro category tanks. Yeah. I was, uh, I don't know if I told this story on this pod. I got a friend of mine who's, it's a friend of a friend, um, who's very high up at a very big barbecue company and you know, COVID was an amazing tailwind for barbecues, mm -hmm. like anything at home just mm -hmm. killed it during COVID. Anything outdoors really. Anything outdoors. Yeah. So, um, you know, just like crushed it for two years, three years. And then summer of 2022 hit where, you know, we're, we're, unlocking, right? We're back to, we're going back out in the world. We're allowed to travel again, all those things. Well, retailers were so overstocked because of these long cycles that you were talking about, mm -hmm. right? Like they were expecting inventory on this day. It came three or four months later. And in the world of barbecues, a lot of this stuff is made domestically, but it's long lead times and it's hard to make. It's fabricating steel, all that good stuff. Retailers wound up with like two, three years worth of barbecues on their balance sheet. Yeah. And this barbecue company sent 80% of their manufacturing staff home because they're like, we are we're, we don't need to make barbecues for two years. Yeah. Right. I'm and like, that's not even that uncommon. I mean, it's there's, not so, that many, uncommon. there's so many examples like that. You know, I, I remember talking to um, somebody that was in mountain bikes in 21 and it was like, they hadn't had inventory at all for several months. But I'm sure then all of a sudden you get into a situation where two years later, you got two years of inventory because yep. it's like, you know, guys, we got to make more, we got to make more, we got to make more. And then you, you get on the other side of the COVID thing. So it's, it's real, man. I mean, the, the thing that makes inventory so difficult, it's like the wisdom that they give you about the stock market, that past performance is not indicative of future performance. Past customer behavior is useful to an extent, like to yep. understand general principles, but it doesn't tell you what they're going to do. And this is truly a skate where the puck is going to be and not where it is. And if you, if you, you find attention. yourself skating where it is, then you're going to get burned. Yeah. That's the, the macro winds up mattering a lot in consumer. I think it, I mean, it matters B2B, I'm sure to a degree. Um, cause there's like downstream you know, second, third, fourth order effects of like consumers, three quarters of every dollar spent. So like if the consumer's having a hard time, everybody's having a hard time. Mm -hmm. I don't care how good your SaaS product is. Like you will have a hard time. Just a question of how much. I think you, you also hit on something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. And it, it was when you talked about Patagonia um, and Yvonne Schwinnard is like famous for talking about this, right? Like you growth is good, but too much growth is bad. And, um, I also, there was a story of, um, Howard Schultz, I think in his book onward, he talked about this, how like there was a period of time where Starbucks was adding an obscene mm. amount of doors. They were opening like four stores per day or something mm -hmm. like eight stores per day. 
And then years later, they realized like, oh my God, we way over inventory this business with stores. So then they had to shut down like 800 stores or something. Yeah. And their stock got killed and all that stuff. And I remember reading this and this, this theory has stuck with me since then. I've been thinking about it a bunch lately. Is that every business, every business has an ideal size for the, its, at its point on its own timeline. So, like in consumer, you know, I, we all talk to enough brand owners. This idea of like doubling and tripling every year is pervasive, right? And yeah. every time I talk to somebody who's like, um, you know, we did eight or nine million or 10 million last year, we want to go to 30 or 40. And I'm like, how are you going to pay for that? Mm -hmm. Like, what, what wizardry are you doing with your supply chain? Like, do you have balance sheet that can do that? Are you like your cogs just so obscenely lopsided that you're fine? It's like 98% cogs. So like, who cares? Um, or gross margin. So I, I think that like high growth in consumer can be very dangerous um, purely for the, the risk that you're talking about. But I also think like, I believe this now that I, I believe that every brand should expand should really consider like what is the ideal size for our brand in the market that we're in for how long we've been around and almost yeah. look at it through a longer timeline and say like like it doesesn't take much to double a business right you can grow 25 percent a year for three years and you doubled your company and if you do that consistently over a decade you wind up very big and most of the people in our chat in all of our chats they've been around a long ass time Mm -hmm. Like I, number one question I get is like, what's the path to a hundred million dollars in sales? I'm like time. Yeah. Seriously, Six, time. Seven, like, eight, Hexclad ten aside. Years. Time. Yeah. yeah. And, but, but you know what's, funny, <laughs> what's funny about Hexclad is that the time is still there. They, they yep. were not very big for several years. And then COVID I think was a, um, kind of a, a turning point or a, a catalyst for them to go to the next level. And then the Gordon thing was a catalyst, but uh, it, it's true. And, and one of the points that I would make here is that the reason why brands typically want to grow is they realize for me to get X amount, for X amount of money to be able to flow out of the business, we need to be at, at you know, Y revenue. Yep. So we need to be at 30 million in revenue for this thing to be able to, you know, distribute $2 million or whatever. And that's what uh -huh. I'd like to see happen. And this is where it really is, you know, as I like to say that business is a form of the marshmallow test that, you can't, you can't just will it into existence. And if you try to, you submit the business to a bunch of risk. If the longer that you can not need the business to distribute, the better, because it sets you up to make the optimal business decisions. And yeah. like you said, that gr you can you can grow any business to the point where it can create excess profits that are distributed to shareholders and obviously from like a personal finance level that's where everybody wants to get that's that's the good stuff but it's a it's usually a multi-year process sometimes even close to a decade to get to that point because you've got to get to scale and that scale takes growth and if you don't manage the growth rate um, you know I think covid for me was a wake up call that there were points in the business that I had run it in such a way that if I had gotten, if the economy had taken a negative turn, I might have blown myself up. You know, mm. to some extent, we talk about it all the time, survivorship bias, but this is part of the survivorship bias is that a lot of the brands that survive and get really big and have the amazing growth stories the part that doesn't get told is that they were very aggressive and they happened to do it in a period where there wasn't a lot of chop in the water. And so they yep. got away with it. But yep. usually if you try to over a five to 10 year period consistently year after year after year, push it all the way and be very aggressive, eventually you get blown up because you get an event, whether it's COVID or, or something like it, you know, the great financial crisis that you, you're not, you're not prepared for. Yeah. I mean, have you read um, Morgan Housel's new book? I was telling Sean about this too. Like it's just yeah. the same as ever. There's always another black swan event, right? Like we just have to assume that there will be. And as an operator, you need to operate paranoid. You know, my business partner calls it, he calls it my productive paranoia, right? Like I'm, I'm kind of operating scared all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's just because I've been around long enough and been kicked in the nuts enough to know that like every year, 
is going to have something that comes along that I just don't see coming. That is the actual very definition of risk is it's risk is what's left over when you've done all the thinking about risk, like yeah. real risk. Yeah. So, it's the unexpected. It's yeah. You know, I, I heard Morgan got a chance to meet him and heard him speak at uh, main street summit and more or less the point that he made there is just that, you know, risk, risk is the thing that you're not thinking about usually. And, and that's yeah. why you can't mitigate it and you can't plan for it is because, you know, nobody had, nobody had a, a international pandemic as a thing that they were trying to mitigate in, in boardrooms across America. Nobody was thinking about that as a primary mm-hmm. risk, but you know, here we are one, one kind of idea that I would add here. I do think again, because your inventory position can really matter in relation to your competitors. I think when you strive to to build a business and you do take time to consider what is our strength relative to our competitive subset of companies, that's time well spent because you don't know what the next big thing is and they don't know what the next big thing is. But you can know that your industry is not going away, for example, right? And that if you're one of the stronger hands, it's it's kind of been said that, you know, like when it comes to the global economy, that if America catches a cold, the rest of the world catches pneumonia. What you mm-hmm. want is if there is this kind of asymmetric risk out there that can't be planned for when it comes to inventory, you want to make sure that you're one of the strong hands that doesn't get shaken out when something like that comes. And so... It's like the it's like the Forrest Gump thing. Like, uh, just to draw one analogy here, we've talked about it before, but the the uh, Pyrex and uh, and uh, oh, what's the the cooking thing? I'm I'm blanking on the name right now. Uh, Instapot, Instapot mm. conglomerate bankruptcy was in large part fueled by this kind of stuff, like the air fryers and and going really big, and and then you know in 22, 23, everybody bought an air fryer. Um, but you know what I would bet? I would bet Shark Ninja and some other people have been huge beneficiaries. They had to go through that period of air fryers being massively overstocked and oversaturated and downward price pressure and all that stuff, but it took out several of their competitors. And so if you've ever seen the more movie Forrest Gump, there's, they're trying to to be shrimp boat captains and they're not catching anything. And then there's a massive storm and they're like the one ship that doesn't sink. And he says, you know, after that shrimping was easy. And so like, I, I think you can also say, Hey, I don't know if next year's a good year or bad year for my category, but I am going to try and be one of the companies that's positioned in such a way where come what may, I'm going to be one of the strong hands. And then if we do catch a really, you know, a really bad run of months or, or quarters, then I'm going to be one of the ones that doesn't get shaken out and gets to see the upside on the other side of it. Yeah, that's a great point. It, it's like, yeah, it, it, to me, you know, we, Sean and I were chatting a little bit about risk last week too, but this is like inventory to me is the biggest pile of risk in any consumer goods business. And, you know, thinking of it, I've, I've never actually thought of it through the competitive lens. Like where is the entire category what, what assumptions can I safely make about the people I'm competing with in my categories? Um, you know, we've built Peel a Case like very much to be inventory light, very nimble. Like I can react to a trend if we have to. Do you think that like when you're looking at Simple Modern right now and you said you're, you're thinking of macro a bit more, your category has been on fire. Yeah. Right? Like I mean, just on fire. It's arguably. Um, is that a risk area top for two you? Or three. Yes. I mean, it, it, yes, absolutely. A hundred percent. Yes. And hmm. uh, I have told people recently that what has gone on over the last, especially 12 months is that there's been a redefinition of how much money people are allocating to our category. Hmm. And that's either going to be a blip that you know an anomaly where th- people just lost their mind for water bottles in 2023 or it's a more permanent shift um that just the category and this being a thing that you spend a few hundred dollars a year on for the average woman is just like this is more normative behavior um hmm. obviously i'm hopeful it's the, the latter 
But if I'm not prepared for the idea that it could be the former, then I'm not leading my business very well. Yeah. And, you know, like obviously we, we had an unbelievable year last year. And so what do you do when you're at, you know, when you're at a top? Because we all want to create moments like that where there's so much demand. And we had some of those in 23 where there was just so much demand for products that we would get it in and we'd sell a half million dollars in a day and we'd, we'd sell it down wow. to zero. And it was, it was really wild, but the way that, the way that I communicated with my team during that period was that, Hey guys, you know, when it's party time, you party and you deal with the hangover later, but you can't do that in every area of your business. We're going to do that with this product line. That's doing really great. And we're going to be more conservative in all these other product lines so that we can be aggressive here. And this is where. I think as your business gets bigger and you're able to be more diversified, there can be a strength in that, that you can Mm -hmm. take different approaches. For many of our listeners, they're single product companies or they're, they're a tightly related group of products. And so that's not really possible. Um, But I, I think you have to ask when you do kind of catch lightning in a bottle and things are going great, that's exactly the time where some of this advice that we're laying out is the most critical because it can just feel like we can do no wrong. We should just push every chip in, in. And often that's the time to be taking a step back and saying, hey, is this sustainable? I'm going to Send Lane, guys. Q1, January, sign me up. I'm going to Send Lane. Jimmy asks, consistently proven that he is there to support us even when we were not a customer. He helped us solve email issues. Uh, I'll be really honest with you. The cost savings is probably the biggest driver for me. I think I'm going to save like over $100,000 a year switching. And there is nothing I would not do to save $100,000 on SaaS. <laughs> like the, the, whatever the darkest thing you're thinking, yeah, that's me trying to save money on SaaS. So that's a big driver. And... Uh, Look, I, I believe in the product. I've seen it. I've seen the demos. People, people are like, oh, is not migration going to be a pain in the ass? Yes. That is why I did not migrate in Q4. It's never going to be painless to do one of these things, right? Like I've been on Clavio for 10 years. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time and effort to put it in. But Jimmy is the type of guy who's committed to make it as seamless as possible. So I'm very, very excited to switch to Sendlane. Um, they're a startup, man. I think their culture matches mine. I'm excited to be there. So... Photoshop a send lane logo on my jersey because that's where I'm going, guys. <laughs> Love it. Hmm. Do you um I know we share some domestic manufacturing sort of like ambitions, and I think yeah. Sean is too. Do you feel that or think that your investments there are going to make your company more resilient or are they more investments that'll make your company more nimble and more growth oriented? Like wh- what is it? Like when you look at yeah, that particular it's a great area question. So one, one book uh, that I would recommend to anybody listening to the podcast that I've been reading recently, um, it's called the innovator solution. It's by the mm-hmm. same person who wrote the innovators dilemma and Clay Christensen. Uh-huh. I, th- I think that's yeah. right. Um, one of the, the things that he talks about in there that I thought was really interesting is that basically every industry has a period where the product is in a not good enough phase where customers want the product to be able to do more and they'd pay for it to do more. It just can't yet. And then every product category has a point where it gets to where the product is good enough. And you, it's not to say that you couldn't make the product better, but that customers aren't really excited or willing to pay more for improvements because it already so adequately fits their needs. Yeah. And the the argument that he makes is that there's different skills that earn you outsized returns depending on whether you're in this not good enough or already good enough category. He argues, and it's been a very interesting idea that I'm processing and thinking about with domestic manufacturing, that once you get to good enough, then the battlefield shifts from trying to make a better product to try and make it faster and more customizable, which I mm. thought was really interesting. And that's probably where for, you know, I would say you and I and and Sean and Jason, you know, for all of us, we probably yep. live in the good enough place. Yep. And so 
uh, I, I've been kind of turning that over in my head. And it's, I, I will say this, that is very consistent with what I'm seeing in market, that the excess mm. returns are driven by a combination of brand and speed and fashion and customization that there's some that in that space is where all the excess profits are, are being generated. So I think that I, I've vacillated over a lot of different perspectives of like, how is this going to impact the company long-term and what's the, the yeah. best part of it. But I think today where I'm at is that being able to make more customizable products and being able to address things, be more agile, being faster, that's probably the number one advantage that we're going to get out of it. I'd love to hear what your answer is to that. Man, you know, I we've thought a lot about this and we've been making, we've been vertically integrated now for what, 2024, man, three plus years, I mm -hmm. think. So, it's funny too, like in three plus years, I feel like we're finally getting good enough at it where on Friday, I sent a note to my COO of that company and I'm like, by Feb 1, I want to make sure that we're doing like a new drop every week, like mm -hmm. some new collection of stuff every week minimum. And then the, you know, by Feb 1, like, let's just put a timeline on it. Like we're good enough now we can do this. And then by March 1, I want it to be like two a week. Right. So like in every year we get a hundred plus shots on goal. And that's sort of the theme for our business right now, like in both companies is just shots on goal. And that investing in that kind of domestic manufacturing ability, nimbleness for sure, but it really is just allowing us to take more shots. Cause once you make the realization that you just made, which is that like the, the outsized returns are in fashion and trends. Mm-hmm. You immediately have to figure out like, well, shit, how do I just, I can't, it's a guessing game. Yeah. We never know what's going to hit, what's yeah. really going to hit, what's not. You know, we can look back at the last 12 months, which I just finished doing. It's like, what was our, what were our winners in the last 12 months? And like, those aren't our winners today. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're always in this, like, we're trying to find new winners. And then that mostly just comes down to being able to take shots on goal. And when you, and at an inventory level, for us and for you and for everybody who makes physical things, China is the world's 3D printer. It's amazing. It's cheap, but it's slow. Yeah. It takes a long time to make something and get it here. Yeah, you just can't, you can't pull it off and you can't fewer than, than maybe call it three months from like trying to order it to get it there. And, and listen, you know, we're living in a world where 23 was pretty great for global logistics. We've already got these Houthi pirates um, shutting down uh, yeah, some the Suez of the, Canal, right? yeah, the Suez Canal, and so uh, the that is going to ripple out in a lot of different ways. It's going to make air shipping more expensive. So I, I do think that point, you know, going back to this idea of speed, you want to get a lot of shots on goal, and so let's say you want to right launch a hundred designs. Well, you can do that with like 500 of each, but that doesn't, that's not going to help you drive returns, right? Like, so, okay, so yeah. something hits, so what? You, you're out of stock for three months. You know, even when you do find something, you take, can't take advantage of it. What you're looking for is the magic combination of, hey, I can take a lot of shots on goal. And when one goes in, when I do really find the home run, I can scale up with that thing. And to me, that's where the argument of having domestic capabilities to help scale up with something are so powerful, especially yeah. when you're in these fashion based things that can last six to 12 to 18 months where the time, you know, the windows are, we, we had one of my more, um, self-critical perspectives at the end of the year was we, we had a couple of times in particular where we had something hit and we sold, I mean, we, we sold a half million dollars a day. We sold it out. And if we had had an unlimited supply or if we'd had, you know, then we probably could have sold, I don't know, $5 million, $7 million, a lot. And so that was disappointing to me that we had domestic manufacturing, but we didn't have the ability to, to do that. We, and it, this is one of the things about domestic manufacturing. Like when you sell thousands of SKUs, there's a lot of different 
types of manufacturing and and types of skills and and that you can have. And so we just didn't ha- happen to have that particular skill set. And that's something yeah. that we're going to try and rectify this year. But it can help you when you do get something that where the opportunity is right there, where you can scale up at it. So what it's percentage a great point. Of your, what percentage of your business right now is made is like the product is made domestic? It's a single digit, uh, partially yeah. because we ran into two things simultaneously. One was we've we've had a harder time figuring out exactly what the strategy we want to employ with plastic is than we thought. Yep. Um, and, and I think that we may even, uh, change things up a little bit more there, but then also we just grew so much more than we expected. So I, I probably would have told you at the beginning of the year, Hey, I think we can get to 10% or maybe 11 or 12%. it's like, we probably got closer to four. Um, mm. so, but, but See, I I'm think, 80. yeah, that's amazing, Matt. I mean, that's, and, and that's an, an advantage of a real competitive strength of the company that you're you're able to use. And, and it is worth saying that, you know, you're multiple years in and just now are you saying, Hey, I want to be able to put a hundred shots on goal. It took you years to build to that place. And, and this is, if there's one thing that I think we've really hammered home on this podcast, it's that you can do amazing things. You can build a company that can can do things that would blow your mind. I, I just posted a video on Twitter. Somebody documented every SpaceX launch um, from the launch pad. And oh, I saw that. It, that it's so amazing, cool. isn't it? Yeah. Like at first, yeah. it's like one every few months, and then it's like there's about one a month, and then all of a sudden they're just you know it, it's like the Fourth of July. They're just firing off constantly, and this is the, this is the nature of how things build. Like you can build things that would have seemed inconceivable, but Mm. it does take time because these things do progressively build on themselves. And so you're just now multiple years in, you've earned the right to now be able to take a bunch of shots on goal and hopefully to create outsized return and returns as a result. Yeah. Now, you know, the thing that I'm just on this inventory topic, the thing I am worth considering now is because this is the, it's the great limiter in all of these businesses, the physical thing. It is like, mm-hmm. I consider it the ultimate throttle, you know, the throttle back is our stuff. Um, the thing with Pila now is like, we're trying to figure out like, where are we going to grow? You know, is, yeah. is our, is our future growth for this business? Is it mostly in North America? Is it in Europe? Um, cause if it's in Europe, then this on demand thing I've built in Canada, is great for the U S and Canada, but it's not so awesome in the UK and the EU. Right. So, you know, the problem with owning your own manufacturing now is like, it's a little slower to scale, right? Especially sure. like either vertically or horizontally, it's not super easy to just move into a new building. You know, that like there needs to be real estate available. You need to get all, so like those things take months all on their own. But one thing we're considering doing is whether or not we take this machine that we've built, this factory, physical and, you know, uh, not, um, and do we replicate it? Mm-hmm. Do we actually go and take this thing that we've built and like replicate it into Europe? Because that's where we're seeing decent growth in certain markets, you know, and then that would give us a competitive advantage in those markets. Like then the business could actually, because fashion is local, you know, there's yep. certain things that are global. Yep. The internet has definitely flattened that out. But when it comes to design, like things that matter in Spain and Portugal and Italy are very different from things that matter in Canada. Especially if you're doing things like incorporating text, you know, like it's literally a different oh, language, God. right? Totally. You know? Yeah. So I, I think it's a great, it's a great point that just illustrates how the, the truly great businesses, a lot of it is structural and that structure yeah. takes a long time to build. You know, Coca-Cola would be a great example here. Mm-hmm. A lot, you know, Coca-Cola has great marketing. They've, they've been around. In fact, I, I read recently that like the American perception of what Santa Claus looked like, Coca-Cola is the one who popularized that. That's kind of crazy <laughs> that like the big jolly guy, you know, That's like, amazing. That, 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 um, you know, I, I guess he, I guess there's the, 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 uh, you know, the Christmas poem where he has a bowl full of jelly, but like the picture that we all have in our mind of Santa with the beard and everything that Coca-Cola did that. So they're, they're great on a lot of different dimensions, but I would say Coca-Cola's maybe biggest moat and biggest advantage is that they've just got an unbelievable distribution infrastructure. Yeah, and that, their defense is there. Yeah, it took decades to build that. So I, I think that 
inventory is an area where early on, obviously you're not thinking about building all the infrastructure. You're thinking about making smart decisions, not getting over your skis. Um, but then longer term, you start to be able to use profits and capital to build out infrastructure that makes it easier to be good at and deal with the problems that come with inventory. So, okay, one question I have for you, Matt, um, because I'm, I'm just kind of curious. When you get heavy on something, heavy uh, on inventory with something, when do you make the decision to either destroy or uh, light it oh. on fire and put it on discount? Okay, so check this out. So in Pila case, because in, in Lomi, there's no like, it's like there's yeah. one skew. Yeah, you it's haven't really ever right? had that cycle with Lomi yet. No, no. And it's the cycles are so long that we can plan for them. We know that we're going to end of life one version of a device and another one's going to take its place because those are years out. Yeah. Pila case though, phone models drop. There's like, we sell 30 different phone models, hundreds of designs and colors across them. So even though we try to be as on demand as possible, we're still going to wind up in a position where we have, we have mm -hmm. product, right? And like, and then we don't, that's a, that's a pure D 2 C business. So we don't really sell in retail or another channel, mobile accessories for retail sucks. So what part of the reason that we went domestic in our manufacturing is if we wind up with too much stock of a particular product, we actually have the equipment and the ability to take it and regrind it mm. into new raw material and reuse the material. To so recycle we can actually it. like that's awesome. Recycle and upcycle our own shit. Yeah. That's awesome. Right? Not all the time. Like there are things where, like, like you said, like very narrow skew where we might be like a year worth of inventory, but it's super narrow. And you're talking like thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars in hard cash that's sitting there. So it's not huge. Um, but one of the things we love, man, is that like, we just don't waste a lot, right? Like all of our material is useful. It's useful. We think up to three times. We haven't really had encountered that yet, but like I could take the case that's on my phone right now and have it reground and make another black one, like of a different phone model. Yeah. Right. So that is quite helpful. It also like, admittedly, we went down that path mostly for values. It's like the whole brand is built around like waste and minimizing waste. So for us to, to like destroy and field, when I first learned that term, destroy and field, what's might, in this company? You, you define, like, define that for everybody <sighs> listening. So destroy and field is something that like, when you start selling into retailers, these retailers at some point, they'll come to you and they'll just say like, look, it's cheaper for everybody if we literally just throw this shit in a, in a dumpster in the back or burn it or something, right? That's what they call destroy and field. And Amazon does it. Amazon does it all the damn time. You just don't hear about it. Um, I would actually love to see uh, some kind of reporting on how much the dollar amount of stuff that Amazon destroys and field every year. It's like things that are in their warehouses. Just think of the volume of stuff that Amazon has. Mm where they've decided their, their systems are like, we're never selling this. Either you take it back or we're just going to destroy it. And most often than not, the brand or the is like, we don't want it either. Let's just take the right off. Um, but it's like, it's one of those dirty secrets of the world of physical things is that this happens quite a bit. It actually happens a lot after Christmas. You know, you come out of the holiday season and returns spike. Right. And a lot of return merchandise just goes into a big old destroy this shit, destroy and field. Like just, it, we don't want it. Right. Like return, like reverse logistics is something that we've never explored on this pod, but we should have a reverse logistics expert come in to talk about the flow of stuff that goes back from people. People think that when they send something back, that it's going back onto a shelf somewhere. Yeah. I think like 20 or 30% just winds up being literally burned. Yeah. Never yeah. be seen again. Yeah, there's so, a lot of that, unfortunately. Yeah. So we and try the, the luxury, to the luxury bands are the absolute worst about that, by the way. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah, totally. So yeah, man, I try to like not have to deal with the TJXs where you blow out like, you know, there are lots of channels that I'm aware of that, you know, and I don't know if you guys use them where it's like you wind up with too much of something. There are buyers out there that will take it, blow through it. The TJX group is one of them. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're a really wonderful place to put old stock because they don't compete with you online. So you don't run into like, you know, um, 
price matching and all the other crap that causes us all pain. Um, you can go into other countries. I know people yeah. who do that. So it's like they're they're not moving it in the US, so they'll send it to Mexico, Brazil. Like there's there's buyers all over the place for your stuff that doesn't move. We've just structured our business in a way where like that doesn't happen often. Shout out to some North Beam MMM um, and, and some other areas, which we've been doing the work, but we saw this a year ago, how impactful TV has been for us. And yeah, and I've been saying this too, it's like a lot of people are on Facebook, but not everyone is on it. Not everyone is on Instagram. Like, I don't even my think controller it's that, and my and my staff accountant. I'm talking to them the other day, and they're like, because <laughs> I wanted them to log into Meta to be able to check how much we owe Meta, because we went on invoicing <laughs> for this period. They're like, we need to create Meta accounts to log in. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, you don't have a Facebook account? Like, no. I'm like, what? You don't have a Facebook account? You're you're in your early 30s, late 30s, late 20s. Wow. No 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 account. So. And also, I think TV, TV just gives you your brand a level of credibility and trust. It's trust. Just by being there. Yeah. Well, I, so one final thought I've got here, because I, I think we've already gone over an hour, which has been, it's been awesome. But I, I think the final thing I, I would say that relates to this is that it is easy to get attached to an inventory position and to not think as analytically and unemotionally about it as you should. My perspective is once you realize you're really heavy, that you just, you take action uh, yep. one way or another. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Uh, but that's always been the message to my team is that, mm. you know, like, hey, we've, we think we've got 12 months. Okay. Like, what do we need to do? Let's cut. Yeah. And I, I do think there is a difference between a product line that's going to continue to be around and a product line that won't. We could talk about all the different kind of if then statements. <clears throat> but, you know, once you realize like, listen, there's going to be misses, it's fine. Once you find one, you just, you deal with it. Yep. Um, but what you don't want is you don't want, I, I have noticed that in organizations, sometimes the inertia is towards just not dealing with it and kind of sweeping it under the rug because it kind of, I don't know, shows that somebody did a bad job or had it wrong or whatever. Sure. And that you need to, you need to really build a willingness to just, to just cut it whenever it's not yep. working and on to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Sunk cost fallacy. Sunk cost bias is like a real, real thing. And when it comes to your cash, which is inventory, it's a bad place to, to let it leak into the business. All right, man, this has been a fun one. I'm, yeah. uh, I'm like, we've gone for more than an hour talking about a topic that I genuinely dislike. Um, <laughs> Nobody gets excited you know, about inventory. It's the least sexy don't. thing. No, it's not. But it's funny. Like I, when I was thinking about this episode today, I'm like, what questions do I want to ask Mike? <laughs> One of the things that came up for me um, is that like I come out of the marketing side of, of commerce mm -hmm. and I can't tell you how many times I have like watched a media buyer or an agency or somebody just bitch and moan about like they're doing their job so well, but the brand is constantly running out of stock and the brand could grow further. And all I've ever thought is like, man, if you just knew how hard the supply chain was in these businesses, you would never complain about. Like if you sell out of something, like great, but like it's not as easy as just as like turning dials and well, pushing and here's, buttons. Here's the thing for anybody who's on more of the marketing side, like think about it this way. Ceteris Paribus, the world continues on exactly as it is, as it is today. It's very difficult to inventory plan. Yeah. But when you've got like something like, let's just say meta ads in this case, like it's not uncommon that you hit a new creative and now you can spend three times as much. What yeah. do you expect? What do you expect? Yeah. Of course, when you 3X the number of eyeballs and clicks, like nobody's going to be planned for that. And so one of the... Uh, analogies I'll use sometimes with my team that I think is helpful. Building a business is kind of like building a car. Like I, when I was growing up, I played the, you know, the games where you kind of, you, you win a race and then you got some money yeah. and you can put a little bit better tires or whatever. You gradually kind of upgrade all the different parts of your car. So if you think about building a business as like building a car where you're gradually upgrading every piece, one of the things that I really drive home with our team is 
hey, you can't just drop, you know, like a, a an A plus engine in your car and expect it to be able to go 200 miles per hour. Because you know what? Your everything else, right? Mm-hmm. Your, your tires and your struts and your, you know what you know whatever isn't built for that engine. And so it's a process of gradually upgrading every single piece of the car a little bit. And as you do it, you realize, okay, now I've got to go and I've got to upgrade that. And that when you have an area of your business, like, okay, marketing had a real breakthrough. We can hit three times as many people. That's great. But realize none of the rest of the car is built for that. And now we have to go about trying to get the other parts of the business at a place where they can deliver on that. And so and and don't get frustrated like this is the this is the process that you're going through when you build a business um and it, it because it's easy when you get an unlock in one area to just be frustrated why that can't just manifest itself across your business and it just doesn't work that way for anybody yeah totally agree i think it's a great place to end this show man dude this has been fun i like it great We're talking back. matt and yeah, now, got new year. Record Thursday with everybody. So. It's gonna be it's gonna be a great year. We're gonna have some great yep. episodes this year. 